Yeah. All right, well, thanks, um, SoCalMojo.js. I apologize if you can't hear me. If you're in the back, you can't hear me, tell me to speak up. I've been talking all day, so I've kind of <coughs> started to lose my voice. Um, so um, I'm excited to talk to everybody tonight about suboptimal API experiences. Um, it's going to be hopefully entertaining to you uh, and lacking of technical subjects. So I'd like to just impart some stories and we'll do a little story time here. And um, I'll turn it around into how we've kind of um, made that a successful strategy for our company. Um, I sort of think of myself as a extroverted geek, which means I look at your shoes instead of my own. So <laughs> I think it's funny. Uh, All right. So suboptimal means you know less than highest standard or quality. Um, for some of the things I'm going to tell you about in my experiences, that's actually a compliment. Um, I kind of like to think of it as something like this, which is um, at first blush, you look at the docs, you look at the promise of um, what the API is telling you about, and you're like, yeah, all right, I'm all over this. And you start investing more and more time, and as you peel the layers back, you realize what's really behind the sauce. So, um, but before I do that, I'm just going to tell you about what our company does. Um, VideoAmp is a one-stop platform that we plan by measure and optimize video advertising across all screens. Um, what we do is kind of cool in a technical sense. We deal with hundreds of thousands of requests per second. And that's pretty much the opportunity to buy a video ad impression on a mobile phone or desktop computer, or it could even be a television. It could be broadcast television, it could be over the top inventory like Hulu. Um, <clears throat> and so we kind of stitch together all the different screens that are out there rather than this sort of siloed advertising line, which happens out there. Um, right now we have 30 data scientists and engineers. Um, and, gosh, I think the next slide. Um, we just closed a Series A a couple months ago for 15 million um, from RTL and a bunch of others. So All right, there's the spiel. Uh, usually you would see all these stickers on my laptop, but I'm waiting for my decal to come in. But these are all the technologies we use. Um, Certainly, Node, D3, Angular, Golf, Sprint, uh, all this stuff, Docker, it's a big part of what we do, um, along with Apache Spark. Um, our claim to fame is kind of being one of the first data product companies that built their platform on top of Spark from the get go rather than this old Hadoop like workflows and stuff. But that's another top popular. Before I get too deep, um, I just want to talk that um, we really love automation, and actually, Node is a big part of that in our company. So we do a lot of end-to-end -end testing, which is automated testing for a UI. We let the machines do all the heavy lifting. And I'll even talk if there's time a little bit on how we do automated ad testing. It's all node driving browsers, which is kind of fun, actually. I think you're pretty long on that. <coughs> all right, quick ground rules. I'm not going to name names so that I can talk a little more freely about the companies and or about the experiences versus who the companies were. So don't ask me who. When you see red, that means I'm going to do a call out to the audience for um, it, for their for your response. And um, if you have random questions, we'll just um, group it up at the end. All right. All right. So as you saw on my laptop decal sticker, we use Scala and Node primarily at our company. Um, Node plays a huge part for our API. Um, it allows us for customizability. And um, you know, we sort of dog fooded our user interface on building an API um, first. And you know, by doing so, we were able to actually support clients like trading desks and, um, and the like, which don't really care about our UI. They just want to send us API calls and let us do their business. And I guess, to put it in a better perspective, you know, what we do is we buy apps. We listen to all those big requests, hundreds of thousands a second, and we have to respond in like 30 milliseconds. So it's not an easy thing to do, and not every other company out there can sit on the ad exchanges like we do. So what our customers want to do is they want to send us insertions for apps, um, and Node plays a huge part of that. It's kind of the connective tissue of um, all the rest of our company, actually. Yeah, all right. So yes, automated trades, which means a bug can cost $11,000 in just seven minutes. And uh, it's happened a couple times, actually. This is my partner, Ross, and that's what he does when that happens. Um, 
It's pretty crazy. You can't make any mistakes. You gotta get straight A pluses. Right? You just can't make mistakes. So there's a lot of checks and balances in the architecture to make sure we don't. Alright. So before we published our API, we used a bunch of other ones and we still are integrating with other ones. And I don't know why it's flipping, but um, you know, it, it, it just, it's just amazing that some of these companies, which are huge, would let some of this stuff happen. So that's what I'm going to share with you uh, right now. Let's get into it. All right. The first one, uh, incomplete specification. Finding out that there are missing or hidden API methods is to me unforgivable. Um, and sorry, I'm going to read a lot of this because I didn't have time to put the slides together. Um, so, you know, with all the tooling up there for like auto generation, there's like a, a bunch. API area, Swagger, um, there's, there's so many out there. Um, there's no excuse for not having documentation in line with your code. And you should be able to just hit a button or run a gulp command or whatever and build that documentation. Publish it to an endpoint, and then all of a sudden your customers now have the latest interface and they know how to use your stuff. And yeah, it's just unforgivable that people would hand code the documentation, or even worse, send it to you on a PDF, right? All right, the first reach, uh, the first call out. What's your favorite option uh, program? Anybody? Swagger. Who said that? Swagger. All right. I like it because I have. A swag bag here. All right, here is a Bluetooth uh, shower speaker for you. <laughs> it's funny you said swagger, but <laughs> all right. Stay on it. There's some more red coming. All right, so the other one is Futsword. Pardon me. Example. <laughs> so this happens when they deliver you the documentation on PDF. But all the sample data code like spans across page breaks. You can't just copy paste it. There's UTF codes that are the wrong kind. They are backticks or whatever. Um, and then they don't have to take the step. You would have been better off just typing them or something. Right? So this is ridiculous. You'd be amazed how many people do this. It's, it's a lot. Uh, if I can't just copy paste the code, I'm going to All right. <laughs> Not really restful. All right. This is the topic that can go to blow people sometimes. But really. You should use the verbs for what they're there for. Um, and instead of putting verbs and stuff in the URI, you should basically use them what they're for. Um, some other things are like, you know, metadata for pagination, offsets. Um, and it's ideal that, you know, you get um, versioning inside the URI so you can sort of support multiple versions of an API at once. All right, who's got a big gripe about REST? Get commands that require URL encoding. Get so. commands that require URL encoding. Yeah, to pass something. Okay. It's not a get anymore. Didn't you just win? <laughs> <laughs> you can't win twice. All right, anybody else? There's more swag. All right. All right. Can you use Yeah, who said that? All right. <laughs> no? All right. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Well, show. It is. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't take calls in the shower, but you can listen to music. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is where it gets really messed up. The sandbox is not full of sand. So. So, okay, say everybody, say all the above is correct. They got all that right. They need to do docs and everything else that's up to date. Um, it's. Limitations or shortcomings in the sandbox that really get you kicked off. So there's a lot of them. The first one, um, you know, the first thing you should do is like I usually just go and write spec tests with some kind of specking uh, framework, and um, you know it's just like a bunch of uh, very um, semantic sort of tests. Like I should be able to log in, I should be able to get a list of that, I should be able to add this, and, and really it's like a happy path of whatever you're doing with the API, and it should be repeatable, right? <clears throat> and, um, you know, ideally they're pre releasing the next version of their API to a sandbox and letting you version it with URI or whatever. Um, and, and so, you know, basically by not, um, yeah, I guess my third right is just not having the version of the API. I'm, I'm happy to discuss that if anybody differs with that. Um, another one is people tell us all the time, oh, just integrate straight into production. 
It's like, yeah, it's cool. Um, so this causes significant concern for us uh, because the live calls may result in us spending money with them. Uh, and certainly in the case of the API we put out there, if you are using our fraud API, you could rack up a $7,000 bill or a $10,000 bill in a few minutes. So anything that charges money, gosh, you better have a sandbox, right? And it has to match the dock 100%, or else you're in a sandbox with no sand. The sandbox has worked for cul-de-sacs. Um, these are things that it's a little more edgy, but certainly it's a problem for us. So you know, we're this like full circle workflow, and then you post us stuff, and then we start buying for you, and it takes a long time for data to go full circle. So what we've done there is we have out of band API calls. So you can do a bunch of stuff if you're writing tests. You signal some API calls to things that you normally wouldn't do, but they move the data through a set of stage of fixtures that simulate the state as if you run for a day, let's say. And then all of a sudden, boom, at some other endpoints, you can pull reports. And you can start to see how it's going to be when you go into fraud long before you go start spending money on this. Because it's like all about getting confidence with people before they do that. So this is just a creative way to sort of allow people to progressively load fixtures along the way that assume like, hey, we, let's say we won for a day. What would that next uh, state of the system look like? This one speaks for itself. <laughs> yeah. So this happens. There's some out there like where we have to do our work at night or at odd hours because they just don't do a lot of resources at their sandbox. I don't care. Um, well, okay. I mean, going into the reasons for this, it's like I get it. They might have like substandard hardware in their in their um, sandbox or their development environment versus what they use in production. It could be poorly indexed relational databases. Uh, it could be timeouts, tunings. There's just so many um, theories as to why that is. But whatever they're doing, it's not like their production environment. And that kind of sucks. So they could, you know, these people that have this kind of problem, they could at least use more BP hardware. Um, and it would certainly uh, boost developer productivity and it would boost confidence. All right, yeah, and then that's this <laughs> So when that happens, we just move on to other things, right? All right, this is ridiculous. The sandbox only allows 200 calls a day, as if that's some kind of way around the other thing we just talked about. Well, you know, we fight under all the time. So let's just limit what people can do with us. You know what that does? It prohibits you from running periodic tests all the time. So what I like to do is make sure that they're not changing. So I may schedule tests all the time against somebody at any point. Um, and if I have a good relationship with the company, I'll ask them to let us know whether the new API will certainly be proactive about running lots of tests against their sandbox, assuming that it's like a step or two behind production. Um, so if you're rate limiting, you're just begging for engineers to fail on you. It's just not a solution. It's happened. Uh, this one's good. Immortal garbage data, right? So if we're running these tests all the time, guess what we're doing? We're racking up a huge database full of stuff. And in fact, inevitably, you're going to probably put a lot of entities into a database that are more than the production environment might have typically have. And it's always going to be on inferior hardware too, right? Or most likely. So all of a sudden, when you're running tests hundreds of times a day, or just in a work day, you're just save, run, save, run, save, run. Uh, you're going to fill up their database in a way that they don't even expect. And they're going to be like, what the heck happened? So if they're good, they're going to reset it and load it back with fixtures to a uh, stable state. Um, if they're better, they're going to allow you to have a delete method. There's actually a lot of APIs out there that don't support delete. It's because it's convenient for them. It means, well, we don't want you to delete because we want to know how to charge you or you know whatever. So there's a lot of strategies there. It's like you should allow delete in the sandbox. You should allow delete, or you should disallow delete once you've racked up charges, or you should do soft deletes where it just was the status but it's still there, um, etc. So 
Um, if you could even create one out of band call which says reset the whole database, you can call that, run your flows, and then you're kind of always running with a pared down database rather than this database that gets so bloated, you have to email their support every single time. Hey, will you reset my environment? It's like, I broke it again. So if they let you clean up your toys, it's going to be way better and you can make it as part of your testing flow. So the delete is the delete. And then this one also speaks for itself. Snail mails four times. Um, you will be surprised how many companies take two to three days to respond per email. Um, this means that it may take you six to eight weeks to get something done with a simple API integration. Um, so I lose respect with those companies, um, and it just does not make sense why it would take that long. Clearly, they're just understaffed. Or who knows why. All right. That was bad. Let's talk about how we turn that around. And this is these are imperatives for the folks on our API team. In fact, our whole engineering team. Number one, we already talked about this. Auto-generated API docs. There's no reason not to do this. Um, you should do it from the beginning. It's not a bolt-on. You can do it as you go. Sample toys. Um, along with giving a client OAuth credentials and an endpoint, we provide them with sample implementation. They may be a Java shop, but hey, they can at least read, read node code. So they're usually just spec tests. Um, and so what, what we do is we code up the happy path into a series of, of specifications, and you can at least see, all right, if I post to this endpoint with this JSON, and in this order, it's probably going to work. And so when we give people these creds, we even give them the code to exercise it. If they want to go rewrite it in Java or Clojure or whatever, they can go do that. Um, so to me, it's like we're breaking down all the barriers for people to get the confidence enough to want to work with us. There's no reason not to give them everything to still be fired. Oh, um, you know, uh, authentication. So here's your password. Uh, yeah, stellar unboxing experience. So that's kind of all part about what I'm saying here, which is the first time user, I mean, the engineers that do API integrations, they tend to do them a lot. So when they look at your stuff, it's not the first time they've seen them, right? It's like, you should be able to look at docs and go, oh yeah, that's going to be good. You should be able to size it up quickly. And so if people are able to get in there and get immediate gratification within minutes, pull people to stick, that's huge. And so um, this is like our overall mantra. This is the unboxing experience, the initial thought, the initial feeling of that user. Um, we already talked about this. It's just we do do this as uh, you know, mocked events or whatever, which simulate processes which normally take hours or days to complete, uh, or simulating user-driven events, which normally, normally just happen in production. It could be uh, someone clicked an ad or whatever. So um, this allows you to sort of stage a sequence of predictable events, and then you can go query on the data, uh, recording endpoints, and be like, yep, there was three clicks, or I'm ready to call. So it simulates a closed loop, which normally would take like five ads, which of course we're not going to do. Ah, this is my favorite. So we use Docker, and so everybody gets their own sandbox. Um, that's how we're able to get away with these uh, methods where you may wipe the database or load fixtures or whatever. And so um, it's easy to provision one of these environments. It's the same thing for our engineers on their first day. We just Docker compose up a bunch of stuff, and you get your own little video in it. Um, and you know, we it's like we don't have much of a differentiation at the low level between a QA environment or a staging environment, and to, to a large extent, even production. It's literally just uh, environment variables at that point. All right, and then lastly, of course, um, just dedicated API support. So within the data response times, uh, Slack channel for our important, most important customers, uh, and you know when someone emails us in, there's definitely a designated API engineer, usually the most lead or senior person, that's just responding right away. There's no reason not to at least if it's going to take a while, I'll get back to you, etc. There's there's so much to be said about just the email etiquette and the warm fuzzies that come along with that. All right, I probably missed some. What did I miss? What's some other successful strategy for APIs that I did not talk about? Yeah. 
Um, so we have to have that too. And in fact, we have our um, internal ops data platform that just rolls out for that. And it's just all automatic. Um, that, absolutely. Well, oh, um, I'm sure. Actually, I have a couple more here, but yeah, I mean, this actually, I have just a few left, so see me afterwards if you've got more. Um, it's going to be a size thing, so it's going to be hard for you. What else did I miss? I, I just wanted to mention data because yeah. um, I don't know if your doctor may spin up a, a new database, a fresh new database as well as Windows, but I know that's always been a problem. So, yeah. Um, I've always liked to have a canned set of data that yeah. they can always know will be there so that they can start fresh, or if I'm creating an API, create all of my tests with a set of data that you know you're going to be able to get and you can again to create all your tests against. And yeah. um, you know you can delete it, it shouldn't be there as well. So that's been, that's very helpful for creating um, a deeper level of tests. I totally agree. So um, when you have control of a code base, oftentimes the first step of your flow should be like truncate the database, load these fixtures so you have a predictable state of things. And then if you add four things and you go to the history, there should be four there. And you can write all kinds of tests out there. I, I agree. Um, that's the out of bandwidth aspect of that, which is people won't have command line access to the environment. So if we make special routes in the API that trigger those things to happen. Absolutely though. <clears throat> it's hard to write predictable tests on top of a database that you don't know this data. It's, you shouldn't do that in For most kinds of tests. Yeah? When you're writing an API and you do the out of band test for the sandbox, how do you make sure they stay out of the production? I mean, something like Data. Yeah. Oh no, I sure don't. How do you how do you automate that those things don't show up? There's um, environment variables for everything, and I'm pretty sure the guys who engineer that have like if not prod or there's there is there are checks and balances to make sure we don't drop our production. Yeah, you have to you control it at the routing level. Like Jim was more tuning that this was the result. Like right? last month we had scheduled a two hour meeting with a trade with a client. And they were done in twelve minutes. We good? We good? We good? We good? Okay. And so because we came prepared, right? We came prepared with all of those things that I talked about. Um, we had spun them up in our environment. Um, we gave them OAP keys at the meeting and email out to their developer group. And you know, it was Christmas break or whatever, or holiday break or whatever, and so we had one follow-up email since then, and now we're basically closing the contract. So we're like, well, are they going to ask us more questions? Well, no. Like, they see everything they need in our docs. So to me, that's a win. Um, there was not a lot of back and forth. The email they sent was just asking for a bunch of new features, which, hey, we're working on it. You know, we'll start up this. So to me, that's a win. Um, I, I think... Um, you know, rather than tying people up with uncertainty, that's what we kind of achieve by following some of these premises. I don't know if I have any more slides because I can't preview this one. So. Oh, yeah, all right. Well, we're, we're, we're hiring. There's a seamless <coughs> tooth there. Um, if anybody is interested in what we're doing, just please see me during the meetup or reach out to me at Dave. I think that's it. Yep. That's all I got. Thank you very much.